Hey everyone, it's Mark here. In this video, I'm going to go over why you should consider diversifying your portfolio and some of the benefits that might arise from diversification. Now, whenever making any of these investment decisions, always put these in the context of what your objective is. So for example, your investment horizon, how much risk you want to take on, what is appropriate for your specific situation. And it is very difficult for me to convey what that will be for your specific characteristics. So don't take this as financial advice, just take this as general information. But in short, diversification can convey some significant benefits, particularly as it relates to how much risk you might be taking on. Now, I have a background in finance, I have a PhD in finance, and I'm a quant, so diversification and the like is something that is directly relevant to what I'm looking at. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the benefits of diversification and what exactly it involves. So let's start by looking at what happens when you add more stocks to your portfolio. And in short, this might be a familiar graph to you. It's basically plotting what amount of risk you take on based on how many stocks you have in your portfolio. Now, what you can see here is that risk steadily goes down the more and more stocks you add. This is arising from diversification. It arises because stocks are not perfectly correlated with one another, meaning that when one stock is moving up, another one might be moving down. Now, as long as they're both similarly sensitive to market movements, you're going to be left with market exposure, and you would be eliminating some of that firm-specific exposure that might arise. So what you're seeing here is as we're getting more and more stocks in the portfolio, we start tending toward what would be called market risk. Now, bear in mind, market risk here is slightly arbitrary, i.e. this market here is what we define it to be. It could be a market index, so like the S&P 500, or it could be a broader universe of all investments. So S&P 500 plus crypto, plus property, plus startups, plus whatever the case might be. In any case, it's going to tend toward that market portfolio the more things you add from that market. So for example, if you're tending toward the S&P 500, it would tend toward it the more stocks in the S&P 500 you add. Now what you can tell here is it would appear that as we're getting toward 30 stocks or thereabouts, we're kind of eliminating a lot of that firm specific risk and we're left pretty much with market risk as our leftover. So that really is one of the impetuses for diversification. If you have around 30 stocks in your portfolio, you generally are eliminating a lot of that firm specific risk and just being exposed to beta risk or market risk as we might call it. So that's what diversification effectively is. Now, nah, this is a basic graph that is plotting it. It is however, not the full story. To get a little bit further into this full story, what we can look at is some other types of risk. So we've got standard deviation, for example, uh, as a main one. So standard deviation would represent the standard deviation of stock returns here. You also have a couple of other measures. So R squared here is basically telling you the explanatory power of the market model in a regression. So what we would be doing here is you would regress your portfolio returns, so RP here, onto an intercept term plus a beta here. The beta is not to be confused necessarily with an ordinary stock beta, although it does have some similar similarities here, which is sensitive to the market return plus an error term. So that would be your basic regression model here. This regression model is going to give you what is called an R squared. The R squared tells you the basic explanatory power of the model. A higher R squared tells you higher explanatory power. So if the R squared is one, it tells you that all of your movements in your portfolio are explained by the movements in the market index. If the R squared is zero, then the market index returns or the movements they're in are explaining none of the movements in your portfolio. So in order to interpret what we're seeing here, what you can see is if your portfolio is just the market index, then that is entirely explained by movements in the market index. That's tautological. If you just have one stock, then your R squared is zero, i.e. you're getting a very low explanatory power. Now that to my mind is a little bit artificial. Uh, the zero here would appear to my mind to be a little iffy because let's face it, if you regress one stock's returns onto the market index, you're going to get a non-zero R squared. But still, uh, it depends on exactly what period is it in, doing it and the like, and which stock you're looking at as well. Uh, in any case, if you're looking at 30 to 60 stocks, you're getting an R squared of 86%, 88%, i.e. a lot of the returns in your portfolio are explained by returns in the market index. Another way of looking at this is the tracking error. So the tracking error would be telling us basically the difference in returns between your portfolio and the returns in the market index. So if your goal is to diversify away from specific risk, 
then that would also imply you might be wanting to get wanting to get a low tracking error. Now, what you can see here is the tracking error of zero is tautological when you have a market index portfolio. It's very high when you have just one stock, and it starts to tend down the more stocks you have. But what you can immediately see here is as we're transitioning from 30 stocks to 60 stocks, this transition, the incremental benefit of doing this is relatively low in this particular situation, i.e. there's diminishing returns from diversification, the more stocks that are being added here. Now, we do need to bear in mind, this is a study based at one point in time. Things can change over time. So we do want to resist drawing too many conclusions just from one study. We can also look at this by looking at what would be called the efficient frontier. Now, the efficient frontier is basically telling us uh, the best possible set of portfolios we can get. And it's looking at the risk that is going to be inherent in a portfolio for each given unit of return. So for example, here at the standard deviation of 0 0.015, and bear in mind, these are based on daily returns, we can get two returns. We can get either 0 0.001, or up here about a bit over 0 0.002. Only this top point is what would be called efficient because it's giving you the greatest return per unit of risk. So the top half of this curve is really the efficient half. Now, what is the difference between these two curves? Well, they're both plotting what amount of return you can get per unit of risk when you're combining together stocks. But in the blue curve, so the blue curve, which is clearly above in this graph, in this blue curve, you can always see that it is getting more return per unit of risk than in the orange curve. So what is the difference between them? Well, the blue curve is combining together five stocks. The orange curve is combining together two stocks. So if the orange curve is Microsoft and Goldman Sachs, with the five stocks one, the blue curve, it's Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, IBM, uh, Chevron, and Berkshire Hathaway. Now, these are just randomly chosen stocks that I chose basically at random, to be totally honest, just to give you an illustration. And this is just with five stocks. You can immediately see our efficient frontier is much better when we've got five stocks as compared to when we've got two stocks. Again, telling you the diversification can be very useful. So the next question is, why is that the case? Like technically, what is it about diversification that enables you to achieve this? Now, the technical details are generally not that necessary on a day-to-day -day basis. But if one really wants to understand what diversification is doing, then it's useful to at least see where this is coming from. So it doesn't just look like hand waving and it doesn't just look like I'm putting up a table or a graph and kind of just waffling along. So let's have a look at some technical reasons for why this is the case. And I'll try to make sure that this is as brief as possible so that you're not overwhelmed with irrelevant information. Okay, so to see why diversification is beneficial, let's start off with what would be called the single index model. The single index model basically posits that the return for a given stock is given by its alpha, which is basically its overperformance or underperformance, its uh, sensitivity and responsiveness to the market index, obviously multiplied by that market index return, and also this firm specific error term. It's basically telling you that returns on the market index are a key driver of returns on the stock. Now, this is, like I said, the single index model. The single index model is only one of many models, but it is a simple one that gives us an explanation right here. You can get a three-factor model, a four-factor model, whatever the case might be. So when you've got this model, we can now disentangle what this implies about the variance of a given firm. It tells us the variance of a given firm, here, sigma squared for i, so sigma squared for that firm, is given by two components. Firstly, the market component. Secondly, the firm-specific component. These are not correlated. They are orthogonal to one another. And the firm-specific component is orthogonal between firms. That is, no firm's firm-specific components are correlated with one another. For the market component, firms obviously are going to have a degree of relationship operationalized by their beta. The beta here tells us the sensitivity and responsiveness of the firm's returns to the returns on the market index. So that's what our variance for the firm's return is going to be. Now, from here, we can start building up a portfolio. And when we've built up a portfolio, we're going to be able to see why diversification becomes beneficial. What we're really interested in here is the firm specific risk component to see whether we can reduce that by having more stocks in our portfolio. So for a portfolio, the overall firm specific risk exposure for the portfolio, i.e. the combination of all of the individual stocks, is going to be effectively 
a weighted average of the individual stocks firm specific risk components, i.e. W squared, uh, where W is the weighting, multiplied by the idiosyncratic risk for each individual firm. Now, say we've got an equally weighted portfolio just for the sake of making this simple and making our lives easy. Here, the weighting in each firm is 1 over n. So we just have 1 over n squared multiplied by the variance, the idiosyncratic variance of each firm. Now, what you'll immediately see is you can take 1 over n outside of the summation, and then you're just left with sigma squared over n, which is just going to give you the average idiosyncratic risk. So what this is telling you is your idiosyncratic risk for your portfolio is the average idiosyncratic risk for each firm multiplied by 1 over n. So what then happens as we're adding more stocks to our portfolio? Well, as we're adding more stocks to our portfolio, 1 over n is going to tend towards 0, i.e. as n approaches infinity, the idiosyncratic risk for our portfolio is going to equal 0 because 1 over n is getting larger and larger. So hence why we are going to see this idiosyncratic risk for our portfolio tend toward 0. So that helps to explain why it is that we might be seeing some diversification benefits from a portfolio and why this might arise through the reduction of firm-specific risk. The next question is, how might one actually feasibly operationalize diversification if you were to try to do so in order to bring this into your portfolio? Now, this, like I've said before, is not financial advice. This is just general commentary on how one might consider doing it. And you do need to bear in mind that always invest in a manner that is consistent with your risk profile and if need be, do get professional help to cater to your specific investment needs. So if one were in broad terms trying to operationalize diversification, one would of course be adding more stocks to that portfolio. This then begs a couple of questions about what exactly does one do in terms of doing this? So let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of what one might do. So to see what one might do, let's go back to this table that we had before. Well, you might recall that the incremental benefits from going from 30 stocks to 60 stocks were relatively small, i.e. the standard deviation remained relatively similar, the R squared remained relatively similar if that's what you're interested in, and if you're particularly interested in tracking error, while it did improve when we've got 60 stocks, it did not improve that significantly. So in that case, one might be focusing more on the 30 stock column here. So one would want to add more stocks to one's portfolio, 30 or thereabouts, but I personally, in my case, would not be overcomplicating it. Of course, there's a couple of issues associated with having too many stocks. If you were to have too many stocks, for example, what you ultimately risk end up ending up with is spending a lot of fees on buying those stocks. Even if you were to go through an ETF, you might need to get a couple of ETFs, depending on exactly how you're doing it. So you can get a lot of fees and there are ETF management fees, which will incrementally eat into your returns and or you might end up having to spend a lot of time analyzing a whole lot of companies, which can be problematic. There's an opportunity cost associated with your time if you're doing it yourself, or if you're hiring someone to do it, you're going to have to pay them to do it, which ultimately can be costly. Furthermore, if you're investing particularly in perhaps earlier stage investments, and there are some pluses and minuses for that, so that's particularly catering more towards sophisticated investors, but if that's the mode that you want to go through, then there are often minimum investment sizes and there's only so much you can really invest potentially and feasibly because you're going to have to invest potentially a sizable parcel in each individual company. And that limits how many firms you can viably have in your portfolio. So basically having that 30 stock or thereabouts number is going to be useful. However, there are some barriers that are going to get in the way of you really achieving that in some cases. Not in all cases, but it can be, there can be difficulties and nuances you need to bear in mind. And it can be important to not overcomplicate it. And that's particularly the case, given the next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is that diversification can be along myriad lines, not just diversification of course, random stocks in the market portfolio, but rather diversification can in fact be a little bit more nuanced than that. So to illustrate what I mean by nuance, basically one would be diversifying across a factor, i.e. size factor, growth factor, momentum factor, exposure, to name just a few, industry, and potentially asset class, i.e. stocks, crypto, real estate, etc. Now, when you're considering all of these different cuts that exist, so factor, industry, asset class, 
you end up with like lots of different categories and getting 30 of each thing within each category is potentially prohibitively expensive. So there's a limit to how much you can viably diversify unless you're only going to do it via like ETFs for stocks and REITs for real estate. And then you still end up with potentially suboptimal returns depending on which vehicle you go in. So that's not to say that you ignore diversification entirely. It's to say that you try to be clever when doing so. And to some extent you do potentially want to consider how are you diversifying? And are you going to try to have a layer of fundamental analysis overlaying your diversification? I.e., given that people like Warren Buffett will routinely try to determine which stocks they genuinely believe in, do you also impose an overlay like that? Rather than just blindly diversifying, do you try to also say, well, I'll diversify across a smaller number of stocks, but I'll try to be careful about which ones I'm picking. And I might diversify across a little bit of real estate, of course, it's really expensive, so I'm going to be careful about what I buy. So if it's real estate, for example, it's really difficult to get exposure to multiple properties unless you're very, very wealthy. So there are real limits associated with that. So with real estate, do you go for something safer, which might have a slightly lower return just because you can't diversify very much, so you need to be mindful of tail risk, as an example. And with different asset classes, it can be very difficult, like I've said, to diversify fully across different asset classes. So this graph gives you a bit of an illustration. So I've got the returns from WIDS for different factors in each month of 2020, plotted obviously in different colors here. So we've got market, size, growth, momentum. And now what you'll see is that in each individual month, the factors are doing completely differently, um, i.e. we're just getting a whole lot of variation. So in month one month, as just one example here, we're seeing where are we? We're seeing market factor really high, market factor really low. Or if you're going with specific factor exposures, growth factor really low here, gets less bad here, is positive here. Or if we're going with momentum factor, what's happening with momentum factor? Well, it's positive here, positive here, but negative here. So, I mean, which one you go for is really going to vary each month. And you can try to predict which factors are going to outperform. And there is a cottage industry of people trying to do this, but it does tell you that you don't just want to be locked in to one factor, because if all of your 30 stocks are high growth stocks and they're all in the same industry, then the diversification benefits you expect to achieve might ultimately be lower than you would be hoping for. So that is again, something you do need to bear in mind whenever you're trying to do this diversification. So those are some basic ideas about diversification and how it might influence your portfolio construction. Diversification is important, and it is important to do it in a way that is consistent with your objectives. And it's important to do it in a way that doesn't necessarily go overboard and cause you to churn through fees and annihilate your returns as a result. Now, to be clear here, I do also want to mention another practical or psychological effect here. You also want to diversify in a way that is consistent with adherence, i.e. consistent with you maintaining market discipline. So if you force yourself to engage in diversification, but as a result, become disinterested in investing, ultimately spend less time and make perhaps poor decisions, that maybe isn't optimal. By contrast, if you're really excited about an asset class, so startups or real estate, you're really excited about that asset class and you knowingly forgo some diversification benefit because you're going to devote yourself to that asset class, then that can convey some benefits particularly when that asset class itself, itself has some other return characteristics that might be useful. But I don't want to overstate that because if you were to just go all in on real estate, then you do bear the risk of a real estate crash, which is going to be correlated with the stock market crash, but you are going to bear a quite a degree of risk tied to movements in that one asset class. Crypto is another example here. So if one were to go all in on one asset class, and to some extent, I'm guilty of that myself. You do need to be you do need to be cognizant of what impact that can have on your ultimate returns. So, in any case, I hope that gives you a bit of an idea about the benefits of diversification, the reason why diversification can be beneficial, and some of the considerations to have when you're diversifying your portfolio. And I definitely do hope 
that this video has been very useful to you. And regardless, I very much hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.